Good morning, Sunday School. It is another Sunday. One week has passed since we were together. And I continue to thank God and lift you up in prayer for For I know some of you are regulars that you tune in every Sunday, and I so thank you for that. Today's lesson, we're going to be coming out of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We'll do verses 1 through 13. So if you want to grab your Bibles, we'll get into prayer, and then we'll get back with our lesson. Father God, we thank you for another opportunity to, to study your word, Father. I glorify you, Father. I give you praise. I give you honor that you are so deserving of, Father. I pray, O oh Lord, for those of us that are studying your word, Father, that you continue to give us the wisdom and the knowledge that we need. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to study your word, to read your word. But most of all, Father, we pray that we use your word. We do what thus says the Lord in our lives on a daily basis. It does us no good, Father, just to know the word. We've got to be doers of the word. And I thank you for this Sunday school gathering, Father. Just continue to bless each and every one of us, Father. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay. The title of the lesson will be Love Divine. And as I said, it's coming out of 1 Corinthians. I'll give you a little information about uh, 1 Corinthians or about the Corinthians uh, as a whole. Now, Paul uh, founded the Corinthian church on his second missionary journey. Corinth was a, a city that was a, it was a bustling city. It was a, a vibrant city. It had a, it was near the, the sea, so it had a lot of traffic and trading and things going on. It was also a very pagan place because they had temples there. They had these elaborate temples that were the built there for worshiping false gods. But when Paul came through, he established the church in Corinth, and now he's in Ephesus. And someone has he has gotten a word that they're having some issues with the Corinth church. Now Paul's not able to go back there to him, but he's gonna he's writing them these letters to encourage them to try and and clear up some of the misunderstanding they have to continue to try and give them the the push that they need to stay strong in the Lord. So this particular letter in 1 Corinthians, he's going to deal with the doctrine that they was having an issue with, and he's also going to deal with the relationships with one another that they were having issues with. Now, when we open up the book in chapter 13, Paul has just finished in chapter 12 talking about the different gifts that the Holy Spirit had bestowed upon the congregation. And he has, he was letting them know the purpose of these gifts. So when he gets to chapter 13, he's telling them how these gifts should be used. Paul is going to talk about love. It's called Love Divine. And the unifying topic or the main topic says the most excellent way. Now, Paul would tell them what love is and what love is not. He would tell them what it does and what it does not do. They had all these spiritual gifts that the Holy Spirit had given to the church. You do realize that the spiritual gift that God has bestowed upon Christians is to edify his church. That's why they have the gifts, to keep the church built up, the body of Christ built up. So these spiritual gifts served a purpose. The Corinthians thought they were special because they had different gifts. Some had tongues, some had prophecy, some teachers. They thought that made them individually special, and therefore that was causing a lot of friction within the congregation, that they were thinking they were special people. They were better than the other Christians that was in church, and they were failing to use those gifts as God has distributed them for to build up his church. We open with the first, I'll read the 13 verses, then we'll come back and discuss them. And I'm going to do the uh, King James Version. It says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tingling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountain and have not charity, I have nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor 
And though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profits me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself. It is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own. Is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never fails, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face, now I know in fact, now I know in part, but then I shall know even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. Now, in the King James uh, Version, charity is the same as love. If I also has the, I have the NRSV Version here, and it uses love in place of charity. And sometimes, as I go through this, I may switch over and read something to you from the NRSV because it just kind of gives you a more common uh, view of what they were trying to say. Now, when we start off, Paul inserts himself in there. He uses the I word. He's trying to let them know what he's talking about applies to everybody. He's just not picking out a few in the church to talk to. He's trying to talk to everybody because understand, they need help. They have the church where it's almost being divided between those that the Spirit has uh, bestowed gifts upon and those that it haven't, and those with the gifts are trying to elevate themselves. And there, some of them are saying, I follow Paul. Some of them says they follow Apollos. And some of them said, I'm following Jesus Christ. So they've got a lot of division going on in the church, and they have no unity. And Paul, through his letter writing, until he can get back there, is trying to bring them all back into focus. And he tells them what, from the information he's been getting, what he has deemed the church is lacking is love. And he talks about that in this chapter. He says, though I, Paul is inserting himself in that, he said, if I speak in tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am becoming a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. He's, he's recognizing Though some of the people there could speak in tongues or other languages, and he's saying even though if he could he can speak in other languages when he talks about tongues of men, or he can speak in tongues of angels talking about the angelic speech, and he's saying if I can do all these things and I don't do them with love, it's just a lot of noise. It's just me talking and nobody's getting under, any understanding out of it. I'm doing it all for myself. I'm doing it that I might be looked up to, that I might be uh, glorified. He says, and for that, without love, it's just a sounding symbol, just making loud noise. And he goes on in verse 2 and says, And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains, and I have not love, Again, I am nothing. He's saying, even though he has the gift of prophecy, when God God gives people the gift of prophecy, he tells them what he wants them to share with other people. Uh, they're speaking for God, the ones that are doing the prophesying. So he's saying, even though I have the gift of that, and I understand some of the mysteries of God, some of the mysteries that you're finding hard to understand, I can bring them to life. And I have knowledge, but if I don't have the love in me, none of this matters. Everything God does and has done for us thus far is based on love. And what did he say? They will know you are my disciples by the love you have 
for one another. So the heart of all that we do is the love that God has given us that we should willingly push forward. Verse 3 says, And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profits me nothing. He says, I can give away all my possessions. I can go sell everything I have, <coughs> take the money, buy food, feed the poor, donate it to organizations. I can do all of that. But if I'm not doing it out of love, it profits me nothing. God does not recognize things we do without love. It's just going through the motion. Yeah, those people will be glad to get the money. <coughs> They'll be glad to get the food. But it will not profit you anything because you're not doing it with the right motives. Paul is trying to let them know everything they're doing is got to be with the right motive. And the one and only right motive is love. And love is active. Love does something. You just don't spout off, oh, I love you, and it doesn't show up in your action. Love is an action word. And he said love is intentional. I do things because I love you. I do things because I love God enough to do this. So we've got to have love in anything we're doing for God. He says, though I give my body to be burned, that doesn't matter either. I, I can become a martyr. You know, I can, I can be martyred, but if I'm doing that just so I can go down in the history books of being a martyr, it's not profiting me anything. I will still be dead in my sins, even though I be, died as a martyr. So he's, he's telling them all these things that you do publicly, all these things that you do, if you don't have the love behind them, you're just wasting your time. You're, you're not building up any anything in heaven. We're not building up any credentials in heaven. We're not storing up any gifts in heaven because we're doing these with the wrong motive. Verse 4 says, Charity or love suffereth long and is kind. Love envies not. Love vaulteth not itself. It is not puffed up. He's saying love is patient. You know, sometimes we, we're asking God for patience a lot of times, and he sends us something that really takes us to the edge when it comes to being patient. But that's how love is. Love is long-suffering. It will go with you to the end. It will continue to try and try and try. That's what love does. It just not lets you fail the first time and say, okay, wash my hands of them. No, love is patient. It knows God is working on you and that you're an example from God to help them get to where they need to be. Love is kind. It does not do anything out of uh, hatred or out of uh, I guess, ungodliness. It's always kind in what you do. You speak kind words of people. Uh, you try and do the golden rule. Try to treat others as you would have them to treat you. It says, love is not envious. Don't be jealous of what somebody else has. Don't be jealous of what God has blessed others with. That's probably what was going on in the church in Corinth because they, some had gifts, some didn't have gifts. God gives gifts to be used for the church, to be used to edify the church, to build up his church. And when we refuse to use them in that, that way, they're not benefiting anybody. But he says, but don't be jealous because he gives one the gift of teaching and, and you didn't get it. He may have given you the gift of hospitality. You really have to stay where God has put you because he knows where best to use you. He knows where your light will shine brightest. He knows where that love that you have for certain things will just come right up, just will exhume itself, and, and you'll have that love that he wants you to have for doing the things that he's called you to do. So don't be jealous or envious of what someone else has. He said don't be boastful and arrogant about it. Don't go around talking, oh, yeah, I can speak in tongue. Can you? No, everybody can. God didn't mean for everybody to do it. And Scripture actually says, Paul actually tells them, if you're going to speak in tongue, you need to have somebody there to interpret it. 
Because if you speaking and nobody understand it, what good was it? What value did it have of you speaking in tongue and nobody knew what you were saying? And then some people used to say, well, I'm not talking to them. I'm talking to God. Then you can do that as a one-on-one -on -one with you and God. You don't have to do it in front of a multitude of people. So he's saying, don't be boastful and arrogant about the gifts that you do have. Verse 5 says, uh, don't, do not behave. It's, love does not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, and thinketh no evil. In the NRSV, that same verse says, love is not rude, it does not insist on its own way, it is not irritable, and it is not resentful. Love is not rude to people. You can say things in a way, forceful, still meaning what you meaning what you say, wanting people to take what you say seriously, wanting people to um, follow instructions or whatever you give them, but you do not have to be rude about it. Uh, he's saying love doesn't operate in that way. Love goes to people in a kind manner and tells them what needs to be done or what they need to do and just handle it like a mature Christian. He also says that you, you're you not uh, irritable or resentful of people. You don't get irritated easily. People just don't, as you say, they tick me off. No, you don't, you don't have that kind of spirit that somebody can easily upset you. He also says in verse 6, he switches gears and tells us what, uh, well, he says, love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love doesn't have uh, not glad because something went wrong in your life. They're not excited to say, oh, yeah, they got just what they deserved. Well, I'm glad that happened to them. That's not love. That's not the love of God. But we rejoice in the truth. When the truth of anything comes out, we're glad about it. We're not trying to hide or cover up anything. And we're not rejoicing because somebody got caught or, or somebody else had bad uh, experience and things like that. And verse 7 says, now we switch to what love does do. Those previous verses was what love does not do. Now we're going to look at what love does do. Verse 7 says, it bears all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Love never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. He's telling them that love believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. We believe the good in everybody. We believe the good that God can do in anybody. So love believes the good. We're not always constantly looking for the bad. Uh, we, we hope all things. God has given us hope. He's told us what things to hope for, what today may not be tomorrow. So, and he says, endureth. You put up with a lot because you are a child of God and you know what God has called us to do. He's called us to love one another. And previously we talked about all those things that love will not do. He says, love never fails. He said, then he's comparing to things that will pass away on this earth because a lot of times we're holding on to these earthly things that don't mean anything it's not going to get us anywhere in heaven earthly things are meant for earth and they're not going to get you any closer to heaven not going to get you any better place in heaven they're for here so he's saying what god is revealing to you here is for here and that's when he uses the word that where there's prophecy it would fail yeah, you can prophesy now, but after a while, when you leave, it will be no need for prophecy anymore. He said, whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Yeah, you're speaking in tongue now, but eventually that too will cease. There will be no need for speaking in tongue. Uh, whether there be knowledge, it would vanish away. You know things now, but you have no idea what you don't know until God and, and Jesus comes back and reveals all this to us. So he's saying, what you're living in now, all this stuff you're enjoying now is going to cease. It's going to vanish. He says, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. We only have a small glimpse. We don't have the 
the 360 degree vision that God has. He only gives us a little bit at a time so we can only speak of a little part at a time. Verse 10 says, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When God comes, sends Jesus back to claim his children, all these things that have been going on in earth will cease. There will be no more need for tongue speaking. There will be no more need for prophecy. These things will no longer be needed because God will appear. Everything will vanish as we know it today. It says in verse 11, he starts off, when I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. He's encouraging the church at Corinth to, to mature, to grow up. Stop doing childish stuff and foolish stuff. Paul had been there a while back and, and, and brought this church into fruition and taught them and gave them the tools and know how to do what thus says the Lord. He's left some, some people there to continue to minister and to preach to them in order that they may still stay built, built up. So he's saying, stop fussing over this childish stuff. Stop bickering. Stop doing what children do. You know, stop trying to boast about what you got. Stop trying to tear one another down. He said, you should be maturing by now. You should be moving from level one to level two and so forth. You should not be in the same place that you were when I left. And that's the same way we are today in Christ. Some of us have been in church a long time, a mighty long time. And we're still doing stuff we were doing when we first came to Christ. we still uh, gossiping. we still backbiting. we still lying on folks. We're still doing that which is not pleasing in, to God. We're still only holding on to our money. We're still not tithing. We're still not doing the things that God has called us to do. Paul continues to say, we've got to get off of milk and move further up the line in our maturing with God. We've got to do better than we're doing. We've got to get off of first base. And that's what he's telling them. Stop acting like children and start acting like adults because you now know what is expected of you as a Christian. He says in verse 12, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as also I am known. He tells them, right now you're looking through a glass that's not very clear. In those days, they really didn't have uh, mirrors as we have them today. They often took metal and shined it and polished it so that they could see a reflection, but they couldn't see it clearly. And he's telling them, you're looking through a glass darkly, but one day when Jesus come back and we're all standing there face to face, he says, you will begin to see clearly. You will get that understanding that you thought you had, and you'll have understanding far beyond anything you could ever imagine. And verse 13 says, And now about it faith, hope, charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. Paul says, Of all that you do, all that you say, all the gifts that you have, the greatest thing you can have is love. Love for one another because God is love. His whole relationship is love. His love was so strong for us, he sent Jesus to die for us. And when Jesus left, he told us to love one another. He says, they will know you are my disciples by the love you have for one another. Do they know you are a disciple? Does your love just comes out in everything you do? You know, we have this song we sing quite often in church. This the light of man. I'm going to let it shine. But is that light that you're letting shine, is it a love light? Is it a love light you're letting shine? Understand, love is active. We can talk a good game. But when, when you rubber meets the road, you got to step out with some action. I can't love you from afar and see you in trouble and don't help. 
That's not how the love of God works. I can't be laughing at you behind your back and then smile in your face. That's not the love that God wants us to have. We've got to work toward that agape love, that love that surpasses any and everything, the love that can look over the faults that we all have. Everybody else, you know, you're not perfect. I'm not perfect. So we've all got faults, but God requires us to look beyond those faults that we have and love one another because we are created in God's image. We are God's people and we must love one another. That's what the beginning of everything toward God is, is love, that love relationship. And Paul is encouraging the church of Corinth to, if you put love in the midst of all that mess y'all got going on, that division will eventually die out. Y'all will become on one accord. The unity will be brought back in the church. You can only have unity when you have love one for another. No unity can exist when you got one group trying to be higher up than the other group. So I encourage us as, as, as 20th century Christians, God's message of love has never faded out. He hasn't changed his mind about it. He still requires love, and he requires genuine love. You can serve on all the boards you want. You can go feed as many people as you want. You can, do, you can be at the church 24-7. Every time they need a volunteer, you can volunteer. But if you're not doing it with love, it benefits you nothing. The people that are the recipients of what you do will be okay. But you yourself... It is not benefiting you to go through these motions without love because God will not recognize it. So I thank you for uh, the lesson today. I thank you for tuning in. And next week, we're going to move over into the book of John. Our passage for next week will come out of John chapter 13, verses 1 through 15, and then skip to verses 34 through 35. Or you can just read the whole chapter of John 13 and you will be covered. Thank you again for attending Sunday School. Let us pray and I will see you next week. Oh, will I? No, I think it's Reverend Parrish next week. We shall see. Father God, we thank you for another lesson, Father. We thank you for loving us, Father, beyond our faults, beyond our iniquities, Father, beyond the, the infirmities that we have, Father, we thank you that you look beyond our faults and saw our needs, that we needed a Savior, Jesus, and you sent him, Father, because you loved us that much. I just pray, Father, you continue to, to watch over us. Father, help us to build up this love. Help us to get out of kindergarten and at least move on to, into junior high, but help us, Father, to mature and be the people that you've called us to be. Father, it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.